a very, very warm welcome to all of our Nat Geo kids joining in from wherever you may be watching in the world. My name is Patrick. Joining me on camera is James. And where we are right now, well, that's the Masai Mara Game Reserve, which is down in the southwestern corner of Kenya. So if you do have any questions about any of these cool animals that we're going to be showing you today, please get your parents or guardians to email them to natgeokids at wildearth.tv. I look forward to hearing all of your questions and hopefully giving you the best answers that I can. So joining me today, we have the tallest mammal in the world, better known as a long horse. No, that is a complete joke. They are actually called a giraffe. And this is one of the four species of giraffe. So there's not just one species of giraffe, there is four different types. And this one is called the Maasai giraffe. And I wonder why it's called that? Yes, that is right. It's because we are in the Maasai Mara of Kenya. And so Maasai giraffe is the name given to these ones. And they are actually the tallest out of all of the giraffe. And therefore, they are the tallest species of land mammal in the whole world. They can reach up to 20 feet tall, which is very tall. That's about seven meters or so. So if you're next to a wall, maybe you can see if you can jump that high. Well, I am not the only one here. Well, I'm the only one here, but we are coming to you from more than one spot. We are also coming to you from South Africa and Jamie is down there and wants to say a big hello to you all. I am indeed in Juma. A very good afternoon to all of you because it is actually afternoon here in South Africa. My name is Jamie and this afternoon I have Craig behind the camera. And a special warm welcome to the kids joining us from Nat Geo Wild Kids. It's an exciting time to be out on safari. It's always an exciting time to be out on safari. But today is extra specially exciting because I have absolutely no idea where I'm going and what I'm going to see. And that's always quite fun. You know, it's one thing to know where everything is from the morning before, but since it absolutely poured with rain over here in South Africa, we don't know where anything is. Washed away all the tracks. We, f we find animals a lot of the time by following their footprints and especially for the big cats or something like that. And at the moment, uh, the footprints are, well, they're all gone, they're all washed away. And I'm actually quite okay with that idea. It's nice and warm this afternoon. Google is telling the lovely ladies in final control in Johannesburg who'd keep us on our toes. It's telling them that it is 20 degrees here. It's definitely not. Which means that it is a good time to go and check the water holes because it's nice and warm. Now, I might not have found you an animal just yet, but Rusty has managed to, so I'm going to send you across to him so he can show you what it is. Good afternoon, National Nat Joe kids. Welcome to Safari Live. And we are in Juma and the Greater Kruger National Park. As you can see, we have found one of the most common antelopes we have around here. This is a male impala. And we have decided to see if we can follow up on the watering holes and see if anything has come down to drink or wallow in the water. Because it is a very warm day here and most of the animals we, are, we will either be in the shade or be wallowing in the mud wallows or drinking from the pans that are still around. If you don't know, my name is Rusty and behind the camera we have Yondre and we are going to head out this afternoon and explore. I think that's the greatest thing to do in this area. Okay, so these two males, both males, look, most of our antelopes we have here, males have got horns and females do not. So male impalas, after a certain time, they get pushed out the herd and then they form bachelor herds, all an all boy band, if you want to call it that. And they will hang around in certain areas, but we are coming up to rutting season. Now, rutting season is when males dominate each other. Try, they go going for a fight and they try to see if they can attract the girls for mating. 
So these two males have come up to an open area. Whether or not they're friends right now, they seem to rely on each other, but they are normally in larger herds. But these two, I think, have become quite acquainted with each other and are deciding what to do next. So they normally do make a horrendous sound when they are rutting, but they are not going to play nice for us right now. Sarah, good question. How fast do impalas run? They do run very quick. I'm going to guess at about 60 kilometers per hour, maybe even faster, because they have to get ahead of the predators, which run even faster than that. So at a quick distance, at a sprint speed, they can cover a very quick, a lot of ground very quickly. If we just keep an eye on them, they are actually at a stance where they are, they look like they're about to challenge each other. But being very hot at this time of the day, it's also going to exert a lot of energy. It's like going out for sports in the middle of the day, where you've got a lot of sun, it becomes very tiring. So whether these two will challenge each other later, we are not sure. Now there has been, all around this pan here, it's very barren. Yeah. So all of this ground around the pan here is all overgrazed and been trodden on for all the animals that come down to drink at this small pan. You can see elephant droppings there and this wallow becomes a mud bath for a lot of creatures like buffalo, rhino, elephants. So as every year as water fills up in there from the rains it gets bigger and bigger forming quite a big pan what attracts the animals. So these two impala have taken up residence here. Yeah. While we keep a close eye on them we are going to send you back to Pat in the Mara. And those impalas, such a beautiful animal. And believe it or not, they actually share something in common with giraffe. Both giraffe and impala are both called ungulates. And now that's a bit of a funny word, isn't it? Ungulate. But what that means is that they are a mammal that has hoofs. So if you think of a horse, that is just like these giraffe and those impala. And actually, we have a little water buck to our left as well. I'm not sure. It's just poking its head up. I'm not sure whether we'll be able to see it very well. There, we can just see its head there. So this is also an ungulate. And they have a special adaption in that their toes and their fingers have grown really long. And the toenail is what actually has turned into the hoof. So whenever you hear the word ungulate, now you can know exactly what it is. So just always think of a horse and those hooves. That pretty cool stuff, isn't it? Justin. Justin wants to know why giraffe have such long tongues. Well, they have such long tongues because if you've ever watched one eating, you'll see that they use their tongue to actually wrap around the branch or the leaves that they're eating and strip it off so they can eat it all in their mouths. So if you look at the tongue, and we probably can't see any with their tongues out right now because none of them are eating, but the front part of their tongue <laughs> The front part of their tongue will be quite black, and that's because it's always out in the sun. And so that is why they have such long tongues and also such long necks. Again, because they do feed up in the trees, and so they need to have those long necks to be able to reach all of the good stuff that they want to eat. Which is a very cool thing, and that's all because of evolution and how animals have all adapted to make the best out of whatever spot they are in. And so for the giraffe, this is good because it means that they have an advantage over all of the smaller animals, all of the animals that don't have long necks because they can reach right up in the tree and get what all the other animals can't. Just like when the tall parents can reach the cookies on the top shelf of the cupboard. Speaking of small animals, it sounds like Jamie has something much, much smaller than a giraffe and with a few, well, four more legs to be exact. 
Well, I mean, small certainly when compared to a giraffe, but small in terms of spiders, not quite. So this is actually one of the largest spider species that we get out here. And this poor banded-legged golden orb spider has found herself in a truly unfortunate predicament, or at least managed to, I suppose we could turn it the other way and say that, spin it the other way, if you will. Uh, you could spin it in a different direction and say that perhaps she's actually been very fortunate to have escaped what could have been a life-ending attack. So something happened to this poor spider because, as you will know, spiders typically have eight legs, not five. So something grabbed the right side of the spider or she's bobbing about in the wind. Now, to give you a sense of perspective, even with only five legs and missing three, that spider, if she were to sit in my hand, and I could actually do that, she could, she could bite me, but she wouldn't do me any serious harm. But if I were to put her in the palm of my hand, she would basically fit directly. So she's about what I'm trying to say in a very, very bad way, in a very confusing way, is that she's around about the size of my palm, possibly a little bit bigger. So it's a very big, very brightly colored spider that we see during our summer months. And the reason that we see it during our summer months is because during summer is our rainy season. And that means that the insect life is abundant. So for her, it's the perfect time to build a massive web between the gaps in trees and to use that web to catch things like flies. So you all know that spider silk is phenomenally strong. Orb spider silk is particularly strong, especially the anchor strands or the strands that they use to secure their web. And I've heard, obviously I've never had the opportunity to test this myself, but we know that spider silk is very, very strong. And I've heard that if you were to gather the sort of the, the anchor strands of the silk, and you were just to go and sort of break down every web that you could find until you had enough silk that it was about, made a string about the thickness of a pencil, I've heard that, that if, you, if you were able to test that, it would actually be able, it would be strong enough to hold a plane on the ground at full speed. So it is really, really strong stuff. Now, Rosalind wants to know if golden orb spiders are dangerous, or banded orb spiders in this case. None of the orb spiders are dangerous to people. If most of the time, if you were to walk through this web, and I have done that often, and I've driven through their webs by mistake before regularly, and I've had golden orb spiders or any orb spider species land on my lap, and they're quite inoffensive spiders. They'll try and run away immediately. But if you were to corner them, yes, they're quite big spiders, so they could bite you and it would hurt. And yes, you'd probably have to be careful that you kept the bite clean, as with any kind of break in the skin, you know, there's always a risk of a secondary infection. But they're not venomous. But despite their incredibly brightly colored appearance, and we, of course, know that in nature, a lot of the time, bright colors will be an indication that what you're looking at is dangerous to eat. It, it's an indication that it's poisonous and it's a way of warning potential predators. But in this case, she is not a venomous. There's a difference, of course, between venomous and poisonous. I don't know what would happen if you ate her. I don't know. I've never had the desire to eat an orb web spider. And I have to say that that desire remains the same no matter what happens. But venom, of course, is injected. So if she were to bite you, nothing would happen except you'd probably feel a little bit sore and you'd have to keep it clean. It's nothing like the smaller, less terrifying looking spiders that do actually have venom and can cause some serious damage. Mm. Okay, so we're going to go across from a five-legged five creature to a four-legged one with Rusty. Good. Giraffe, giraffe everywhere, all the way from Kenya, all the way down to here. We do have a few different species of giraffe between South Africa and Kenya, but this is a different one to the one you see up in Kenya with Pat. The one you have with in Maasai Mara is called the Maasai giraffe. There are other species there, but this one is just the plains giraffe, or the common giraffe. 
Now they do come in different shapes and sizes. These are all young males. And like I said with the impalas, these do the exact same thing. They, at a young age, form groups, bachelor herds. And as they mature and get older and are ready to take on a more adult role, they leave the herd and go off on their own. But they need to have all the eyes and ears they can have. So setting up these groups of groups of friends, if you want to call that, then they have more eyes and ears to set about in this place. So, yeah, there is, a, well, I think I counted six of them spread out here. It's quite a nice group of males. Uh, I don't know, they are, seem to be more interacting with themselves than eating today. Okay, well, we've got a very special gadget here that can show you something quite interesting about them. We're going to switch over to the infrared, to um, thermal, sorry, thermal. And that will show you how the temperature works with giraffe. Now, because they're so exposed, so exposed to the sun and because they're such big animals, they can't hide in the shade as easily as most animals do. So they have to have to be able to regulate the temperatures. So each patch, each part of the body is almost like a solar panel that's got a thermal thermoregulator on it. And then you can see the difference in where the patches are to even where the light is, the light patch, light uh, shape around the patches, how it shows how they can change temperature. <laughs> Lily, good, good. They do look very calm. I think because they can see at a great distance from this great height and they can see things coming, they don't feel very threatened. And I'm hoping they're not threatened by us. From this distance, they seem very relaxed, but we did come around the corner and gave them a bit of a fright and they ran off. But they seem very relaxed now. I am going to follow them for a bit. Uh, if this one disappears around the bushes, then I'm going to move forward and see if we can pick them up again. Oh. Yeah. I just love giraffe. I think it's one of those iconic animals you need to see when you come on safari or go anywhere in South Africa or Kenya. They've, yeah, they're just a unique species. Okay, let me just move forward and see if we have better luck in seeing them. Now, you will hopefully see later if we find other females. Females and male giraffe look very different when they're adults. Males giraffe get to a very much, much bigger. They almost get a meter bigger than the females. And they get a very dark skin color compared to the females, which they're very light. So these young males look very similar to females. Ah, oh, there we go. Lined it up. These young males look can be confused, be confused with females with their light color but as they get older you'll see their faces almost get very lumpy as they get older and the horns start wearing down and actually form a bald patch like most fathers and older people men in general go bald as they get older giraffe do the same and also with the faces get all calloused up from fighting and their skin gets a lot darker it's not 90, it's not 98% of the time you'll find male giraffes get a lot darker as they mature. They mature about, let's say, 10 years old. Shira, good question. What are the nodules on the head called? You caught me off guard because I cannot remember the name. I am sorry, but hold on. Uh, Yandre is actually giving me a hint here. Aussie Coats, thank you very much. Aussie Coats are the name of the calloused Aussie Coats. They are the lumps formed on the faces during the yeah, maturing time. They also end up play fighting quite a bit, which also teaches them later on in life how to uh, take on all mm, adult males. So yeah, Aussie Coats is the name of all the lumps on their face. But those other pointier ones are called the horns. They do have a third one in the front that almost looks like it should be part of a unicorn horn, but it's not. It doesn't get much bigger than that, but it does protrude more out as they get older. Now, I don't know if you've ever, if you've watched other programs of little baby giraffe when they are born. They are 
They're, <laughs> they're very comical to watch with their long legs, but they can almost stand underneath the mother's tummy when they're born. And then they grow very quickly in the first two weeks. And then they are, they end up being put into nurseries if these other small ones around with a, a nanny that looks after them. So it is very nice when you come around the corner, you see all these like seven or eight little ones being looked after by a nanny. And if they go off running, the mothers are never far away. So they can at least watch the kids at a distance. If they hear the kids running around and with those long necks, they can see a very far distance and they can always see one another. They're never alone. So it is quite nice. To, it's more success rate of them surviving to an adulthood. So this one is browsing on a, very, a tree that they actually love. It's actually, we can even eat that tree if I can actually look at it. I need to use my binoculars. Yes, that is called a buffalo thorn. And those leaves are edible to us as well. But if they get, especially a tree like that, if they get fed, if they eat too much of it, they end up, the leaves become very bitter. The tree almost like panics because it feels like it's going to lose all its leaves. So it ends up increasing its tannins which makes the leaves very bitter to eat. And then the giraffe at a certain time will go, okay, no, next tree, and then move on. It saves the tree. Thank you. Well, we're gonna stay with them. I'm gonna send you back to Patrick in the Mara. Well, from a very big mammal to a very big bird, we have found ourselves a pair of grey crowned cranes. One of my favourite ever birds in the world. Not just here in Kenya, but in the whole world. And there's no guessing as to why that is. They just look so cool, don't they? Very unusual with those big yellow crests coming out of the top of their head there. Very, very cool. Now, they are what is called monogamous. So that means that they will find a boyfriend or a girlfriend and stay with them for life. Now, we do apologise. There will just be a car moving it through there. So yes, so they will find a boyfriend or a girlfriend and then they'll be with them forever. And that is what monogamy means. They're a very cool bird. I did say they are a massive bird. They can grow over a metre tall or three feet tall. And their wingspan, which is the tip of one wing to the tip of the other wing when it's open, can be up to two metres or six feet long, which is almost as tall as a very tall... Well, it is as tall as a very tall man. They're quite a massive bird and a very cool bird. And this is what they will tend to do most of the day. Just walk around and pick up lots of things off the ground to eat. They are not really too fussy with their diet. Also saying that they are dressed, they look like they are dressed for a party. They most definitely do. A very colourful attire that they have on now. You may have seen them get a little bit scared then, and that was because there was an elephant that made a bit of a sound off in the distance, and it gave them a little bit of a fright. So I was saying that they do have a very wide diet. They're omnivores, and an omnivore means that they eat both plants and meat. So they will eat grasses and nuts and insects and all sorts of things that they can find on the ground which helps them grow up to be such big birds. Ooh, you see that one almost opens its, wing, its wings there. They're very good dancers, these birds. They, we just said that they look like they're dressed up for a party and they also act like sometimes they're going out to party. They will quite often open up their wings and start bobbing up and down in a bit of a dance, which is a very cool thing to watch. So they do mo spend most of their time on the ground, but unlike a lot of other cranes, they will roost up in trees as well. So you will sometimes see them sitting up in trees as well, which is very strange for cranes. Not many of the crane species do that, but these ones do. They're a unique bird in every sense of the word. 
most of the time we see them, they are on the ground, and we do often see them like this as well in their mating pairs, but they will also be in large flocks. Well, these tall birds continue to do what they do best and find themselves food. It seems like Rusty is still with those big, big mammals. Those crowned cranes are beautiful, beautiful birds, and they do look like they dressed up for a party. Thank you. Well, the giraffes haven't moved very far. I think they're very relaxed with us now. The one we're looking at now, you can almost, that bird you see hanging from the chin, it's not an accessory. It's actually eating, helping to keep the giraffe clean by eating the parasites. Oh, okay, it picked a parasite or a hair. So yes, it did not like that very much, but it just flew off to another one nearby. Now those birds help a great deal with how they interact with the, the bush. Now, as much as the giraffes are very high and very tall and they can see for a long distance, the bush here is still very thick. So the birds also help as... Sorry, we, I just got distracted. The giraffes are looking at something more to the right here, but it actually looks like it's an an older adult male coming in from the side. Now they have to be wary because most of the dominant males chase younger bulls away, but none of these young bulls actually have any threat against that older male to, so I think they're just keeping an eye out. But these birds, they help because the giraffes can see a great distance. These birds also use their eyes and they have a very particular call, a noise when they fly off that alarms everything in the area that something's around. So sometimes if you're on a bush walk or we're walking around trying to find animals, you just have to listen for these birds. As they fly off, you can hear the alarm call and then it's an easier way to track out down the animals. As you can just see where they fly out from the bushes, you're like, okay, there might be some buffalo there. There might be some rhino. There might be some giraffe or even an impala. So the birds do help in helping us as well. But for them, they help in a better way in cleaning the parasites. Giraffe girl, is it unusual to have so many giraffes together? That is not, not unusual at all. Young giraffes like this tend to hang around in bachelor herds. It's safety in numbers. So as they, at a, certain, at a very young age, let's say about three years, four years of age, as they start uh, mingling with the other herds, they will try find other young males in the area who have also been like pushed out of the herd and they will gang up. It, this, giraffes don't have a social system like a lot of other animals where there's not a lead male or lead female. So you end up with a lot of loose characters. Some days you'll have like 20 giraffes in a herd, next day there'll be five and like the other five have gone or the other 15 have gone a different direction. These males will stay together, but sometimes you'll come, you'll follow them for a while, then three will go off a different direction. But like I said, yeah, it's eyes and ears. They are the tallest creatures we have here and their eyes are their biggest advantage in seeing if there's any predators around. So safety in numbers, they can look literally every direction if they have more members in their group. So males, young males will form bachelor herds while the females will stay with adult, other adult females or younger females and with calves. And then the big, torrid, or big males that loom around here, they're much darker in color and got massive faces and are a lot bigger than the females. They leave the herds and go and try find females that are in season. And they can grow, cover some massive distances across the area here. Massive, massive distances. Sometimes if it does happen where you get two males coming up to a herd and a female is in season and they want to mate, then you'll find those two males will end up fighting. End up fighting and we never know Sometimes you can hear it from a great distance. A great distance. Balto, they do have very sweet faces, I agree with you. They have very streamlined feminine faces, if you want to call them that, even these young males. As they get older and they get more gnarly and lumpy, then it's not so attractive, but they are 
They have these amazing long eyelashes that people pay a lot of money for, but they are they're just very beautiful, very beautiful animals. Very refined. As you think of a hippo's face and a hyena's face and all the, I can get some other antelopes that are very pretty. But I think giraffes are definitely up on one of the most beautiful animals out here in Africa. They are very intrigued on something and I'm not too sure what it is. They all seem to be staring in one direction and then looking back at us every now and again. There are sometimes the biggest giveaways of leopard or cheetah or lion in the area or another male. I thought it was a male that we saw earlier but I can't see him anymore. Yeah. Okay, well, we are going to take, keep moving on and see if we can find something else moving around in this heat. Keep. Thank you. Well, while we leave the giraffe on their way, we'll send you back to Jamie, who is enjoying her drive. Ah, beautifully timed. I was afraid that it was going to fly away because we actually have something very, very cute to show you. Tew! Little tiny voice there. That is a baby ground hornbill. Oh, no, it's not. What nonsense am I talking about? It's baby grey hornbill is what I was trying to say. And it's only recently fledged. Now, don't go away. I want to see you. Shame. And Mom is sitting somewhere in the trees back there, Mom and Dad. And this little one hasn't quite... Craig, if I put you in that hole there... Is that... Ah, oh, his head's sort of... Sort of there. There we go. You can sort of see him through there. I don't want to backlight him too much because the sun's quite harsh. But you can see there's still fluffy little downy feathers around the top of its head. But the giveaway is that little beak. So the adult hornbills have a very, very large beak, hence their name. It is probably about double that size. It extends further away from their face and with a much sort of broader bull. Now this one is still a fledgling and reliant upon both parents to keep it well fed. And hornbills, like most baby birds, are very vocal about their appetites. So when they're hungry, they do lots and lots of begging. They sort of do a sort of a screeching sound. Now, I can hear the adults in the back. They make the most beautiful sound. It's sort of... <whistles> whistling sound. I've never been much good at bird calls, but that's my best impression of a grey hornbill. And this little one is just hoping that mum and dad might find him something suitable to eat. And I'm just going to sit it out for a little bit and just wait and see actually hear them in the background every now and again. Mrs. Lapwing says that she loves this colouring. It is actually really, really lovely, isn't it? The, the oh, <laughs> little voice. Where's mom and dad, hmm? Come on, you've got to start pulling your weight now. Yes, you do. It's a sideways turn of the head. Oh, cute little baby voice just learning the call so <laughs> sweet they had flown all the way towards treehouse dam and the poor little one was left behind now Lily wants to know at what age baby birds learn to fly. Look, it really, it's species dependent, of course, with, as with most birds, but birds, or as with most things, but birds are one of those creatures that the babies develop very, very, very quickly. They have to. It is essential for their survival, even if it's not, you know, even if there's no urgency for them to migrate or something like that, they, they do have to become independent much faster than something like say a lion or a hyena or a leopard or an elephant so it's somewhere around about between a month and 40 days maybe for some of the bigger bird species that can be a bit longer before they learn to 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 flap around they, they have to learn to fly the instinct is there but they do have to learn so they get their they get fledged at around about that point 
and then they have to practice and they're not very necessarily very good at it in the beginning and they flop around and they're not now for birds of prey that process might be a bit longer the parents keep them in the nest for a bit longer they've got to grow more they've got they've got bigger feathers to grow so it might take more in the way of resources and time and of course as you know the big difference between learning to fly and becoming an adult so that difference is very marked with something like a bird of prey for battaliers being the easiest example because of the the striking difference in their plumage that marks their graduation from a, a juvenile to an adult and that takes about seven eight years before a young battalier gets its adult plumage but it can fly much much quicker than that and i think it would probably probably find that it can fly within two months or so all right i'm going to go off in search of something exciting to find you i might pop around to chitwa we'll see how i feel while i do that off you go across to rusty who's excited to tell you more entertaining things birds 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 you have to love them and i love summer all the birds are more active they're breeding they're nesting and they are making the most amazing sounds in the morning where their voices are heard even starting even before the sun rises some birds are louder than others some we don't want around some we love to follow this bird we're looking at is called a mast weaver and they build these very intricate nests oh you can see a female's just popped out of there the males are this beautiful gold color with a black face and the females are a plain brown and they pair up at the beginning of summer and the males do have a hard time because they have to build that nest and it's almost similar to humans if you if the wife comes home and finds that the kitchen is painted a funny color she'll say no we've got to change the color in the kitchen or if you don't like the rooms you've got to change the rooms if you don't like the curtains you've got to change the curtains so this female will come along the male will show off his beautiful nest he's made and if she does not like it she pulls it down she but you have to understand that these nests hold a family of of chicks so they go through if there's a big storm here that nest gets thrown about all like a lot. So there has to be a very secure, strong nest, even for that family. So the mother, the female bird has to really make sure that the nest is 100% and that the male knows how to build a very strong nest. So it is fair enough for her. Now it is coming to the end of summer and they are, I think they're actually finishing off raising their last chicks for the season. Linda, I agree with you. That is a very beautiful nest. They almost look like Christmas decorations. And if they are very well built, they last all through winter and even into the new summer next year, you'll even still find them standing there or still attached to the tree. If an elephant doesn't come past and eat at that tree, that nest should last a long time. They are, it's a very intricate nest. Um, they, now, if you talk about weavers and nests, we've got many different species of weaver. This one makes a beautiful round nest with a hole underneath and a little cup where it goes into to lay the eggs, while others make this messy tanglement of twigs that look like it's going to be blown apart, but somehow they seem to hold together. Others make a, what you call like an apartment block of nests where there's a, couple, there's a couple of different couples that live inside them, but they're all weaver related. Weaver being they weave nests. So they, they are very particular brand about nesting material and it's normally quite fresh material they use. So they end up using a lot of reeds. So often you'll find this spot here, they often build where you find a branch that overhangs over a watering hole. Now it's a couple of different reasons for that being is they need that space, they need that safety, because being with water all around the base of the tree, not a lot of predators can go out there, like they said, the monitor lizard, the legavon. He, go, he likes to raid the nests, snakes as well, but these also will also like to swim and even go up and see if they can raid the nest. But then as they, you know, as they are around the watering hole, 
they always at the nesting site in the tree they always put the nest right at the tip of the thinnest branches although it has to be strong being at the tip of the thinnest branches it makes it very hard for a lot of predators to get there like snakes and monitor lizards but being around water it stops a lot of other creatures from getting there and raiding the nest Now, if we had come here a few months ago, it would have been crazy with the noises, the males trying to attract the females. They have a big display going on. Big, big display. And I'm still surprised at this time of the year that they're actually still nesting. They should have actually all had their young ones fledge away and gone off. But it is being, it's still very warm and it's still, still summer. So yeah. Um, you'll see Laura Moore do the eggs ever bounce out yes they do and sadly the chicks do too it's normally after a very bad storm or a very windy day when the nest is flicked about in all different directions although the nest is designed to almost be able to like if it's flung about, almost like gravity keeps it inside the hole, inside the nest. But I have seen it on many occasions where babies, especially after a storm or windy day, you'll find babies and eggs on the ground. There's nothing we can do about it. It's just how it is. But this obviously is a survival, survival of the fittest. So you'll find other like other predators will live on the ground and actually come and go around the nesting sites and wait for these juicy. Uh, eggs to fall and then they will eat those like mongooses and other lizards that are around here so it's oh, they are a family of red-billed quelia flying off they are another part of a family which only eats seeds thank you well it's a great great watch watch and building the nest but i think they've done building and they've just got a family and they now watch they are coming to the end of their breeding season. Okay, we're going to watch him for a bit longer, but I'm going to send you over to Pat in the Mara. It is a absolutely beautiful day to be out here. It's a hot day here in the Masai Mara. It's 33 degrees Celsius or 91 degrees Fahrenheit. So the sun is out and shining. Now, I don't have any animals to show you right now, but it's all for a good reason. I'm about to look for a very scary animal. Can you guess what it might be? Yes, that's right, the lions. One of the kings of the savanna out here in Africa. So I have spent a lot of my day with these lions and I'm not far off where they are or where I last left them. And I'm sure because it is hot that they will be laying around in the shade right where I left them. So a male lion on average will sleep or rest for about 20 hours of their day. So we think of lions as being very fierce and very strong and very powerful, but they actually just spend a lot of their time sleeping and resting so they can get all the energy up to be able to go out and hunt their food. I was saying that the grey crowned cranes are omnivorous, meaning that they eat both plants and meat. Well, lions are carnivorous, meaning that they will eat just meat and nothing else. Very different to the giraffe, who are herbivorous, which means that they will only eat plants. So I'm just making my way up and around. They're only a little bit up the road from where I am right now. And so we will be with them very soon. I'm glad you're all very excited to see some lions. Even though I've been with them all day, I'm very excited to show them to you. They are one of my favorite animals to see out here. And the pride, a pride is just a name that we give to a group of lions that sticks together, kind of like a family. So this pride of lions is called the Owino pride of lions. And there is four females and one young male. 
We can tell a male from a female lion because it has a mane or a big bit of hair that goes out around its neck. Now in this one that we will see soon, it's only very short and small because the mane grows with the lion. Well, I'm gonna make my way over to these lions. I'm determined to show them to you. But while I do make my way there, Rusty wants to catch back up with you all down in South Africa. Well, we're on the road again. I am in pursuit on tracks and signs. We did have a bit of rain this afternoon, so I'm hoping the ground will reveal some secrets to me. So the biggest giveaway is tracks. Tracks are obviously very, they will stand out more to me, not so much to you, but I, we have our eyes on the way, road and Jan Jay is in the back, is apparently a very expert tracker, which I didn't know about, but he's got a bit of his money where his mouth is. <laughs> yeah. So we are, yeah, right now we're looking for any tracks, any visible sign of anything that's moved around since the rains this afternoon. <laughs> so yes, we are going to see what has been moving around, left or right. If we do find some fresh track, let's say of leopard, we will definitely do as like a few uh, loop around and see if we can find a shady spot where he might or she might have gone. Or if we find fresh elephant tracks, we can follow them. Or anything in general. Uh, lions at this time of day will be parked up in a shade somewhere most of the time. At a cooler place, I think in the Mara, they will be very be active right now. I, I presume not all the time. It depends on the weather and how hungry they are. But with this heat, a lot of the cats need to conserve their energy and wait for night to fall where it's cool and easier to hunt. Well, talking about tracks, we did find our hina tracks, but it's from before the rain. You can see all the little raindrops inside. Another tracks and signs are dung. Dung from the animals is a big giveaway. They can tell you how. Yeah. Dung is another giveaway of how, what is about. They can, you can find fresh pile that is still very steamy and if you just put the back of your hand on it, you'll just feel the warmth. Obviously, if you put your whole hand in it, it's, you'll have to wash your hands afterwards. But I am not going to do that. If we do find a fresh track, then you can see the warmth and see how old it might be. But that is a, just a giveaway, another giveaway of how old or when that animal was last here. Yeah, so we have the dung, we have the tracks that they leave behind with their footprints and then you have when they urinate you can see how fresh it is there with if the ground is still damp. It shows that it was recent recent. Soon but this heat everything dries up very quickly. So we're not too sure. You can something that if it's a cloudy day, you'll find that some of the tracks uh, stay fresher for longer. If it's a hot day, a lot of the tracks let's say let's the dung and the urine dry very quickly. It's very hard to say how long ago it was, but you can always rough it. You can sometimes get it down to, like, you can say these elephants are here about half an hour ago if it's still warm in the middle, and then it's a good indication of us to follow them. But yes, I do have a few tips of tracking. If you ever get out to the woods or get out to a field, ever to, or if you want to know what's in your area, the tracks are your best way of finding out. So if you do want to know what's hanging around in your backyard, ask your mum if you have, if you can borrow some flour, you know, cooking, uh, cooking, baking flour, and just go find a patch outside. If you don't have a very sandy area, then just use flour and sprinkle it out on a, what you think might be a useful path, on a path that a lot of animals might use. Obviously don't do it in a public park. I think it'll be weird if you find <laughs> flour in there. But you just sprinkle some flour down and you just leave it in the afternoon and come back the next morning and you'll see what's been walking along the, that area overnight. <laughs> so it'll give you a, a good education if you don't have, if it hasn't rained in a while and the ground's very hard, it makes it very difficult to track. So having like fresh flour sprinkled on top it shows what's walking on top of it. Sometimes you'll have the animals stop and sometimes eat the flower. But that's how I, how I used to do it, just to see what was around, instead of following them on hard ground where the tracks disappear. 
but the best time to track is just after the rains where you'll have fresh, fresh tracks of what's around. Another indication, the best time to track is early morning and late evening when the sun is at an angle to your track. That the cover of the shade. <laughs> Lily, would that be pretty fun? What, playing with flower or tracking <laughs> while playing with flower? I think a bit of both. It is a lot of fun and it's quite messy, but it is also fun to see because sometimes you get the exact track of exactly what it is and a very clear track if it's a bit of flower. Well, it just seems to me for, it seems to be a birding day today. And we have two of one of the most, what do you want to call it? They are, uh, we, are proud, we are very proud members of the bird life here. They're called white back vultures. So vultures are the ones that scavenge for meat. So if let's say lions kill something or leopard kill something, they will just, once the lions have finished or had their share and moved off, the vultures move in and clear everything up. Everything gets eaten. It's the, they just pick around the bones and the skin. That's pretty much what's left. These two, I'm surprised are not at normally, oh, there must be a kill around here because there's not only two vultures, just to the left of it, there's also a tawny eagle which is also a clear sign of something dead around here. So I'm pretty sure a leopard or a cheetah might have made a kill. So there is, we will be doing a move around here and seeing if we can find something soon. But it is quite tricky because it is very thick in here. So this tawny eagle is a pale form. They come in very different shades of brown, but this is a pale one. It's very pale. So he's one of the first ones, he or she, to see what a leopard gets up to during the day and will find something that's being, or that's dead lying around. And then he'll swoop in. And these vultures to the right of him have got incredible eyesight. I and mean, they can read a newspaper from a kilometer away. I can't do that. And I don't know any human who can without a telescope. But I'm pretty sure the satellites up there are watching us right now. So that's as good as it gets with humans. But these vultures have got incredible eyesight and can pick up everything at a distance. And as soon as you see one of the birds of prey like, let's say the tawny eagle come in, then they're like, okay, time to get moving. And they will come in and roost to the side. So if it's a very good indication showing that, that they are still on the perch, means whatever is being killed around here, or whether there is a leopard or cheetah or lion, it means that that animal is still around and still feeding on whatever is here. It's only when the leopard or lions leave, then the, then the vultures and tawny will go down and devour what is left that will lure the hyenas in as well. So I'm going to go investigate further and see what's been happening. I'm going to send you back to Jamie. Okay, while well, Rusty goes off to put his uh, tracking skills to work, we haven't had to do much in the way of tracking uh, to uh, find this particular animal, but it can sometimes uh, be difficult to spot. So lurking below the rippling surface of this waterhole lies a pair of very, very sharp jaws, or jaws full of very sharp teeth, rather, and a truly deadly ambush predator. And this is one of the two that we know of, largest crocodiles of Chitwa Dam. So right outside the lodge Chitwa Chitwa. And we have seen these two fiercely at work at times, searching for their food. So at the moment, it looks as though this crocodile was actually sunning itself and it's only just moved into the water. And now as it ducks below the surface, you can just, just see the scales. No, you can't, not anymore. You could, oh, what was that? Is that a fish? It was a fish. Then the crocodile must have made a lunge for it. Leaping out of the water. Huh, surprise. So I was going to say that you can see the scales of the crocodile as its tail's mo tail moves, but you actually can't anymore because it's gone below the surface of the water. And in fact, so have the resident the other residents of this particular waterhole the hippopotamus are also all playing shy this afternoon 
I don't know what it is about today, but it's just one of those days where the animals have decided to go into hiding. I think for the hippos, the reason that they're not out and about, they, they do have to come up to breathe, of course, so they're still here. But the reason that they're not spending as much time with their heads above water is because the wind is absolutely howling. Maybe that's just making them uncomfortable. They'd rather be where it's nice and quiet and still below the water. Uh, I know a place where it is very, very windy at all times. Patrick has uh, battled the elements and made his way to some lions for you. Yes, it's not very windy here at all today. It's quite hot to be exact, and that is why these lions are lying very flat in the grass here. So I did promise you lions, but I did also say that they may very well be sleeping and resting in the hot sun, and that is exactly what they are doing. Now we can see this one here, just at the top of its head there, we can just see a little bit of a mane, although it is making it a little bit difficult in this long grass. Just kind of see it there a little bit. And this is the young male that I was talking to you all about, about two years old. So it doesn't have a very big mane just yet, but if it grows up and gets bigger and stronger, then it will definitely start to grow one. And this one, you can see there is no mane there at all. And that means that it must be a girl. Sometimes the boys won't have a mane, but that's only when they're very young. So when they start to get older, you can tell the difference between the two just by looking at their neck and whether there is a bit of hair there or not. Now you probably wouldn't guess it, but there's actually three lions in this long grass here two of them girls and one of them boys, and they are, as I said, the Oweno pride. Sweet History says it looks like a painting. Well, I could get my eye out and start drawing now, but hmm, I don't think it would be appropriate and might take a bit longer. Well, it is nice to be out here with these lions. I think the rest of the pride is a little bit up ahead of me, but just I will stay with these ones right now. And we can see that they are breathing very fast. Oh, <laughs> one's rolling over onto its belly there. Oh, there we go. Now we can get a good look at that male and his mane there. But we can see they're breathing very fast, and that's for two reasons. They have just eaten a meal, and it is very hot. And so if you've ever seen your dog after eating or your dog in a hot day, you'll notice that they start to pant and breathe a bit heavier. And so will these lions who are actually more closely related, well, very closely related to cats rather than dogs. They are felines instead of canines. So next time you look at your cat at home, you can think, well, you guys are pretty close to being a lion and the lions of the house. I'm glad everyone is happy to see the Aweno Pride. I am very happy to see them as well. I haven't seen them in about five days. And last time I saw them, they weren't having much luck getting food. So to see that they have some food now is very, very cool. Resting peacefully, very peacefully right now. You can see just a little flicker of the tail just to keep all of those insects away. Stuart, yes, it is hot. We are very close to the equator and also very high up in terms of altitude, almost two kilometers or one mile up. And we are also in the middle of an equinox or at the end of an equinox, which is when the middle of the sun lines up with the equator. So we've been having very, very hot days at the moment but not to worry, we love it out here and it's much better than having it pouring down with rain. Wow, what a lovely, lovely sunny day it has been. Um, very, very happy that we were able to show you a real wide range of animals from birds to lions to giraffe 
all of the ungulates, the whole range. So thank you, thank you all very much for joining and sending in all of your questions. I hope that you all will leave today's drive feeling a little bit more knowledgeable and a little bit smarter. Hope to see you here this time next week for another Nat Geo Kids drive.